words. Let's make them the prayer of our heart today. asking you to take your Bibles this morning, turn to 2 Kings and the chapter number 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, we're continuing our series on the study of the prophet Elisha and we pray that the Lord will bless us this morning as we meet around his word. 2 Kings chapter 2 verse number 1. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they went, they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. 
And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the reading of thy precious word, of thy holy truth. We thank thee, Lord, for, Lord, this account, this record of this event that took place so many years ago. We thank thee, Lord, it is for our prophet today, Lord. It's profitable for doctrine, for correction, and all of those things, instruction and righteousness. And Lord, whatever the need be today, we pray that through thy word thou wilt supply our need. We pray, Lord, you'll bless us and encourage us. Help us to see from this passage of Scripture about the majesty of God and the sovereignty of God and the plans of God for his people. We pray that this day we will know a deep sense of thy presence and thy help given in the preaching of thy word. Lord, empty me of self and sin, I pray. Fill me with thy spirit, I ask. May God be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. For his glory alone. Amen and amen. Some time has passed from Elisha's call. He was in the field, as we remember last week, he was plowing. But after the call of God came to him, he slew his herd, he uh, gave a feast, and he gave up the life that he had known for the work of God. The next time we read about Elisha is here in 2 Kings chapter 2. And during the time between his call and the departure of Elijah, there's obviously been a training period. There's been a learning period where Elijah has explained to Elisha the work that he has been called to. He has trained him for that work. He has given him instruction in that work. And I want you to notice some things that we see here on this last day. Whenever Elisha and Elijah are together, before they're separated, I want you to know some wonderful things about our uh, character that we're studying at this time, Elisha. First of all, I want you to notice Elisha's dedication to his call. Elisha's dedication to his call. Whenever he was called in 1 Kings chapter 19, he said these words, I will follow thee. I will follow thee. The part of God's call on Elisha's life was to become a servant to Elijah. That was part of his call to the ministry. And therefore, as Elisha looked at Elijah, he said, I will follow thee, knowing that was what God wanted him to do. And in following Elijah, he was following the Lord. Now, Elijah and Elisha and the sons of the prophets, as we will come to in a few moments, all knew that on this day, Elijah was going to be taken from them. Now, how they knew that, we don't know. It's most likely that there was a prophecy given to Elijah and it was shared by Elijah to Elisha and to the sons of the prophets. But we do know that God had revealed this to them in some way. And whenever we look at verses 2 and verse 4 and verse number 6, Elijah asks Elisha to tarry here. He asks him to stop where you are. I'm going to go on, but I want you to wait here. Now, why did he do that? We don't know. We don't know. Some Bible commentators have suggested uh, that he he wanted to spare Elisha the hardship of seeing him taken away so quickly. Or maybe he knew how he was going to be taken away and he wanted to do it privately and humbly and not to make a big spectacle and show of himself and just to go away and do it. Perhaps he was testing Elisha's uh, resolve and his dedication to his call. We do not know, but what is specified here is that The fact, Elisha went on and continued to follow. And that's to his credit. Because he had made the promise at the start, I will follow thee. And he's going to go through with that promise. In spite of the fact, there was an opportunity for here for him to stop following Elijah. An opportunity was given. But he said, no, I am going to follow thee. Notice his answer in verse number two. As the Lord liveth, as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. As the Lord liveth, he will give me strength and power. As I so liveth, then there's a master for me to follow. I will not leave thee because I made a promise that I wasn't going to leave thee, that I was going to go through. And you know, that reminds me that Elisha had made a promise before Elijah and before God. And he wasn't going to get out of that promise. 
He wasn't going to turn his back on that promise. He was going to see the matter through. I wonder today, am I speaking to someone who has spoken those very words? Has there been a point in your life when you said, I will follow thee? When you talked in prayer to the Lord and you vowed to go through with God, wherever he would lead you, and to whatever work he would call you or to whatever path he would lead you on, you said, I will follow thee. I wonder this morning, are you following? Certainly every single person who's bowed the knee and asked the Lord to save them is he saying, I will follow thee, Lord. I ask you today, Christian, are you following? Are you in following the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you like Peter on the night that the Lord was arrested and tried before his crucifixion? Are you following afar off? Do you spend half your life denying that you're a Christian by the language that you use and the, the life that you live? Maybe you said to the Lord one time, Lord, I will follow thee in holiness and I'm going to be holy and I'm going to seek to do all I can to live for thee. Where are you at today? Maybe you said to the Lord one time, I will follow thee in response to a call to service. Are you serving today? Maybe you said to the Lord one day, I will follow thee. And you sang the words, I surrender all. I surrender all. Where are you at today? Are you still surrendered? Maybe you uh, said to the Lord, I will follow thee in church membership. And the Lord placed it upon your heart to become a member of your local New Testament church, your local gospel preaching church, maybe this congregation here. And you said, Lord, I will follow thee. I'll be obedient. I'll be a member. And you stood in front of the congregation as you're welcomed into membership of this church. And when you were interviewed by the elders, you said, I'll come to the services. And I'll be at the prayer meetings. And I'll be dependable on the work. I'll tithe. I'll help. I'll support. Where are you today? Are you still following in the vow that you made? Have you gone through with God? You see, the reality is God holds us to the promises that we make. And if you turn with me to Psalm 116, you'll see what the Lord would say to you today if you have made a vow and you have not fulfilled it. Psalm 116, verse number 14 says, I will pay my vows unto the Lord uh, now in the presence of all his people. Verse number 18, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. It's interesting in both those verses, the little word now is mentioned. Maybe the Spirit of God has already been working in your heart today. And you're thinking, well, I know I promised that and I know I said I'd do that and I'll, I'll, I'll start next week. I'll start whenever this whole uh, lockdown is over or whatever it is. I'll start tomorrow. Here's what the Spirit of God impressed upon the heart of the psalmist. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his people. Friend, we're in his house today. We're in the presence of his people. You're in the presence of the Lord. Now, this is the Lord's day. Now, this is the Lord's house. Now, this is the Lord's presence. We're surrounded by God's people. What's stopping you? What's stopping you from saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for going back on the promise that I made. Lord, I'm sorry that I'm not in the place that I said I would be. Lord, forgive me and give me the strength to go through with thee. And the Lord will do that. And I'll tell you, the greatest joy will be upon your heart today if you're following in the way that the Lord has led you. That's Elisha's dedication to his call. But secondly, I want you to notice Elijah, Elisha's journey with Elijah. And there's some things that are very interesting about this journey. The first thing that I would note about this journey is the fact that it was revealed gradually. He starts at Gilgal, and then the Lord says, go to Bethel, and then the Lord says, go to Jericho, and then the Lord says, go to Jordan. Now, where was the final destination? It was Jordan. But that is not what he was told at the start of the journey. He was told just to go the first journey, and then the first next step, and then the next step, until he got to the place where God would have him to be. And you know, we often do not know 
very much about the future. Very often we don't know. And in fact, if I put each person in the spot, what is going to happen tomorrow for sure? None of us really could stand up and say with all certainty because the Bible tells us, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And therefore, because we don't know what tomorrow holds or what the next step of the journey holds, our duty, my duty, your duty as a children of God is to obey the step that God has revealed to us today. And then we have the principle in Scripture that's very true. Once that step has been taken and that act of obedience has been wrought, then God will show us the next step. We see that especially in the book of Joshua. The Lord told Joshua to go and do this, and Joshua did it. And then the next thing, and the Lord spake unto Joshua. And he did it. And the Lord spake unto Joshua. And that ought to be our lives, that we obey what we know now, and the Lord will speak to us and give us the next step. It's okay that you don't know where you're going to be in 25 years' time. It's okay that you don't know what's happening in 10 years' time. It's okay that you don't know what's happening next week. What does the Lord reveal to you today? What is the call of the Lord upon your life today? Obey it now, and the Lord will show you the next step. Remember, only God knows the future. Remember that. Only God knows the future. And I know in my own life, and even in the short few years I've been in the ministry, There have been times I have been worried and concerned and fearful over things that I had no control over, that I was convinced were going to work out differently, and the Lord overruled. And I spent time and wasted time worrying and fretting and fearing over things I had no control over that God knew all about, and I didn't have to deal with them because it wasn't today. My friend, we need to remember we are not, as it were, fortune tellers. We cannot tell the future. And therefore, we simply obey God today. We take this step today with a view to honoring the Lord in all that we would say and that we would do. But I will notice something else here. The journey was taken carefully and deliberately. It started at Gilgal. And whenever the Lord told Elijah to go to Bethel, where did he go to? He went to Bethel. And then he told him to go to Jericho. Where did he go to? He went to Jericho. He didn't go a roundabout route. He didn't go some awkward way. He just went to where the Lord had called him to go. A friend, if the Lord's calling you to go somewhere, to do something, if he's opening up some promise for you to claim, some instruction for you to obey, some prohibition for you to stop, just do it. Just do it, and you will know the blessing of the Lord. And as I think about the places that Elijah went to, it's very interesting to note how they are thought of in Scripture. For example, Gilgal. Now, there's a little bit of debate exactly which Gilgal this was. There were at least two in Israel. But certainly, Gilgal is significant because it's the very first stopping place that the children of Israel had when they entered the Promised Land. So whenever they came into the Promised Land through the River Jordan, and they set feet in Canaan, this was the first place they were at. So it's a reminder of the great deliverance of God in their lives into the place of blessing. Bethel, well, that means house of God, and that's the place where the Lord appeared to Jacob. Jericho, that was the place where God demonstrated great victory over the enemies, and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, and then to Jordan. And we know, and we're going to think in a few moments, Jordan is... Uh, representative of death. And you know, as Elijah was journeying near the end of his earthly life, isn't it interesting that the places the Lord caused him to travel to were Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and then finally to Jordan. As I thought about that, as believers coming near the end of life's journey, are those not the places that we love to visit in our hearts and in our minds? We visit the place where we were brought into the time of blessing whenever we were saved, whenever we come into the promised land. We visit the thoughts of the precious times in Bethel and the house of God and the services that thrilled our hearts and the preaching that blessed our souls and the songs that really just gave us the joy of the Lord. Then we think of Jericho and those wonderful victories in our lives whenever the Lord gave us victory over the enemy as we're making our way to Jordan. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord 
allows us to visit such places and have such experiences in our lives. Whenever they made this journey, they met people along the way. And they're called the sons of the prophets. They were there in Gilgal, they were there in Bethel, they were there in Jericho. Now it doesn't refer to them in Gilgal, but we read in 2 Kings 4.38 that they were in Gilgal. So in Gilgal, in Bethel and in Jericho, and it's believed that Elijah was over these prophets. Elisha then would become the new leader of these prophets. So not only was he just visiting these places, it's very likely that he's visiting the schools of the prophets or the places of the prophets, the sons of the prophets. Now, who were the sons of the prophets? Now, whenever you refer to people as the sons of in Scripture, even to this day, the sons of, it generally refers to membership of a group or a class or a gathering of people. It doesn't necessarily mean family. So when it's talking about the sons of the prophets, it's talking about a people, a community of prophets. Sometimes it's called the school of the prophets. And it was a place where they lived together, a place where they received instruction together. Elijah was over it in his day, Elisha in his day. There were different groups, obviously, in different areas. There wasn't just one school or group, but there was several over the land. They lived together, communally. We read that in Second Kings chapter 6, uh, verse number 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight or too small for us. Some of them were married as well. Uh, some of their work was at the command of their master, as we will see through the life of Elisha, although they were able to work on their own as well. And whenever we read about them, there's something interesting that happens. They come to Elisha in Bethel and in Jericho, and they say, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And Elisha says, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Shh, stop talking about it. And they seem to have a great interest, uh, almost a delight in talking about this, talking about how Elijah is going to be taken away and talking about his end. And you know, as I thought about that, Elisha didn't want to know. He told them to be quiet. And whenever we think about that, why would have Elisha told these people to be quiet? Well, here's a man, Elijah, going toward his his time that his life is coming to an end in this earth. And therefore, this is not the time for foolish talk. This is not the time for inappropriate talk. Elisha most likely here is thinking about Elijah and trying to comfort him at this time. Maybe he couldn't even bear to talk about it because it was so uh, painful for him to think that he was going to lose his mentor and his master. And as I thought about that, it reminds us of a very basic principle and important lesson, practical lesson for all of us. We ought to be very careful whenever we're talking about people as they come near the end of their life, and especially to the family of those who are coming near the end of their life. There has to be wisdom. There has to be wisdom. And I think that's a very important lesson to note. You know, sometimes people come in, they ask inappropriate questions, or they maybe come into a house and they make fun of us. You know, we need to be very careful. Then may God give us wisdom as we speak to people, especially people who are mourning, uh, people who are caring for loved ones. May the Lord give us that tender, compassionate heart. But one thing I do notice about the sons of the prophets is this, that what Elijah and Elisha did in their journey from Gilgal right down to Jordan was seen by the sons of the prophets. They influenced those men that day by their walk and by their behavior. And if you notice at verse number seven, it says, and 50 of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. At least 50 men that day were influenced by the lives of Elijah and Elisha. At least 50 men that day were influenced by their lives. I wonder how many people are looking at your life today. How many people are looking at your life today? You might say, well, not many, just, well, at home maybe two or three or four. That would be it. 
But let's think about our lives. We are members of a congregation, so we're in the midst of a people, so there's people watching us today. In our homes, our spouse, our children, our parents are watching us today. Online. Online. You're maybe on Facebook. How many friends do you have? How many people are watching you today? Oh, we've great influence. We've great influence. And may God give us grace to live lives that impact others for Christ. That if we were to ask, what do you think about that person or what do you know about that person? They love the Lord. They're always talking about the Lord. Or is it, well, they love that football club or they support that party. How are we influencing people? Realizing that as we go through life, we've only one opportunity to live. Realizing as we go through life, what we do, what we say as believers will either influence people for Christ or will be a stumbling block. May God give us grace to think about how we speak or what we write or what we post, all of those things that God will be glorified. It's very possible there's at least 50 people you'll influence today. Will you do it for the glory of God? They used their journey and they influenced people for the glory of God. Thirdly, Elijah and Elisha came to Jordan. It's a very significant place because at Jordan, the children of Israel entered into the earthly Canaan. They entered into the land of promise that God had given them. And at Jordan, Elijah entered into the heavenly Canaan. He entered into the land of promise that God has prepared for them that love him. And in verse number eight, Elijah took his mantle. Now I'm going to stop there. I wonder if I were to ask you, what's a mantle? You kind of have an idea what it is. I kind of have an idea what it is until I looked up specifically. It is a sleeveless cloak or a cape. And the wearing of this signified the rule or the office that Elijah fulfilled. And he took it and he wrapped it up and he smoked the water, and a miracle took place. And there's a little word of three letters that I want you to notice in verse number eight. It's the word before the last, dry. Dry. He smoked the water, God divided it, and they went across on dry ground. Not soggy ground, not damp ground, but dry ground. Why has God put this word in here to show us that a miracle was wrought? This was a wonderful miracle of God's grace. This wasn't some accident of nature. This was a miracle of God's grace. Moses with the rod part at the Red Sea. Joshua with the Ark of the Covenant walked through the Jordan. And here Elijah with a mantle also walked through the Jordan. And I want to remind you that the God of yesterday is the God of today. He is the eternal God. He is the unchanging God. He is all-powerful. He is still sovereign. His will shall be done. Now, you could have had one million men standing around Jordan wishing and hoping that that water would part. And friend, it would never have happened. But God spoke and it was done. We have an all-powerful God. He is able to do miracles because of his great power. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of majesty. He has not changed. Thank God he cannot change. He will not change. He is still the same yesterday and today and forever. And his ability and his power has not diminished one iota from the day that this miracle was done. We're still serving the God of miracles. Praise God. He's still the God of mercy because his love is toward those for him, Christ is dead. He is the God of great majesty. In his holiness, he stands in awe. He's the God of justice. He will do what is right. He will judge sin. He will punish sinners. But he will redeem all who will come to him by faith and repentance. And some people read the Bible with the attitude, well, that's way back in Bible times. And those were different times. And God couldn't do that today. Friend, he's lost none of his power. But some of us have lost a high view of God. Some of us have lost a high, great view of God. We have a great God who is greatly to be praised. 
Remember that when you're praying, when you come to a prayer meeting, do you know what you're doing? You're coming to be in the presence with the people of God into the presence of Elijah's God, of Daniel's God, of Ruth's God, of Paul's God, the one who is still able today. Bring that up to motivate us to come in droves to the prayer meeting. This is the God to whom we come. We're coming into his presence. He is able. As I said before, the River Jordan is a picture of death. And Matthew Henry said these words, when God will take up his faithful ones to heaven, death is the Jordan that they pass through as they find, and they find the way through it because the death of Christ has divided the waters that the ransomed of the Lord may pass over. O death, where is thy sting? Where is thy hurt? Where is thy terror? A.W. Pink said these words, all who cling to and follow Christ will pass through Jordan with him. A safe and comfortable way through death has been provided for his people by the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever we come to the river of Jordan, as a hymn writer said, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Jesus died all my sins to atone. When the river I see, he'll be waiting for me. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. We find here, fourthly, that Elisha asks for a double portion. Verse 9, it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou See me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. This reference to the double portion is not specifically asking for a double amount of the power that Elijah had. That is not what is being taught here. The double portion is in reference to the inheritance that the children got from their father. And the firstborn son, the eldest son, got a double portion of the inheritance. So if there were four children, and each was left 100 pounds, the eldest son would have got 200 pounds. Now the reason for that was he became the head of the family. He had responsibility for those people, and therefore he was being given, he was given the financial ability, and he was given that portion of the father's good that he might be able to head that family and fulfill the role that the father was vacating in his death. Now, Elisha was now going to be the leader of the sons of the prophets. Because if you look down at verse number 15, and when the sons of the prophets which were at view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. So they recognize this is the, the next man to be in this position. He is the successor to Elijah. Now he knew that. And therefore what he is asking Elijah for is this. He's asking to be equipped for the work that God has called him to do. And the attitude here is this, that he wants Elijah to see him as his spiritual heir, as a spiritual son. And therefore, in asking for a double portion, he is asking that he would be equipped to do the work that Elijah had done and that he has now been called to do. He was going to need wisdom. He was going to need faith. He was going to need grace. He was going to need strength. And therefore, he was praying, Lord, give me what I need or Elijah, sorry, give me what I need to fulfill the role that God has called me to. Now, some Bible commentators do believe that Elisha's ministry was twice as long and that in the scripture, if you compare, that he did twice as many miracles as Elijah. And that may well be true. But the reality is this double portion is a reference to Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, about the inheritance that came to the firstborn on the passing of a father. Now, God has called you and God has called me to many different responsibilities. 
We have many different callings upon our lives. We're first of all called to be Christians. Many are called to be in church membership. Some are called to be spouses, some parents, some are children of parents. And whatever those roles are, we need the help of God. We need that portion from the Lord, the ability to fulfill the calling that God has placed upon us. I wonder if you ever stopped and prayed. Maybe there's children here. Have you ever prayed? Uh, Lord, help me to be uh, a good son or a good daughter for my mom and my dad. I wonder uh, if husbands here prayed, Lord, help me to be a good husband. Wives, help me to be a good wife. Parents, help me to be a good parent. Church members, help me to be a good church member. Oh, whatever your calling is in life, have you prayed that the Lord will give you that portion? And what's very interesting is this. While it was a hard thing, he said in verse number 10, if thou see me when I am taken away, it shall be so unto thee. In order to receive the blessing, he had to keep his eyes on his master. Is that not true for you and me? In order to receive the blessing, we must keep our eyes on the Lord. Oh, so easy today to get distracted. So easy today in this ever-changing world and so many things bombarding us, we can get distracted and taken up with this and taken up with that and time passes so quickly. Oh, Lord, give us grace to keep our eyes upon thee that we will receive the blessing. None who look to Christ are disappointed. None who look to Christ are empty-handed. None who look to Christ are a stumbling block. Oh, we need to look to Christ. How important it is. And then the final thought is this. We see how suddenly God can call a person into eternity. Verse number 11, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. You see, Elijah and Elisha were walking and talking. Now he knew it was coming. He knew it was this day sometime, but as they walked and as they talked, the Bible says, behold, all of a sudden, how quickly the call came. How quickly this appointment came, this appointment that had to be kept. And friend, we do not know the day or the hour of our call out of this scene of time. Elijah did know the day. And yet scripture reveals to us it was suddenly, even for him. David said, truly as the Lord liveth and as I so liveth, there is but a step between me and death. As you go out today, you have to take a step to go out of this place. As you walk down the aisles, remember, there's just a step between you and death. As you walk down the steps at the side of the church, remember, there's just a step between you and death. Remember, it's so brief. Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Friend, if the Lord comes in our lifetime, it's going to be suddenly. At a time whenever we least expect it. If your death comes, it may well be suddenly. And we notice that they were parted. And it says there, they were parted asunder. And that has the thought of uh, parted separately. They were both parted asunder. They were separated one from another. A friend, whenever your time comes, you will be separated from the one you're standing beside. You'll be separated from time. You'll be separated from your possessions. You'll be separated from your loved ones. Are you ready to die? This morning, are you ready to die? And my final thought about this is this. Elijah went up to heaven. That's what the record is here. The end of verse number 11, he went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And therefore, this was a blessed end of the human experience for a righteous man. Elijah did not die, he went to heaven. Enoch did not die, he went to heaven. My friend, for those who die in Christ, they die well. The Bible says, blessed are those that die 
in the Lord. Why? Because of the place they're going to that God has prepared for them. Now, think about how he died. He died in triumph. He died in victory. He was taken up into heaven to be with the Lord. But do you remember last week in 1 Kings chapter 19 that he prayed the Lord would take his life? Do you remember that? He's sitting under a tree and he said, Lord, just take me. I have tried and Lord, I'm the only one who's faithful and look what's happening to me. And he felt sorry for himself. And God said no to that prayer. Isn't it wonderful that God answers according to his will? That's why we ought, oft, ought to pray, Lord, if it be thy will, if it be thy will. And the Lord said no because the Lord didn't want him to die that death and defeat and despair and discouragement. The Lord had a greater plan for him. And I want to ask you as we bring our time to a close this morning, will it be up to heaven for your soul? Or will it be into hell? If you're not saved, then you're condemned this morning because of your sin. You're not known in heaven. Not in the book of life. Not among the song of the angels because you've never been saved. You're on your way to hell. But the Lord who parted the Jordan as Elijah smote it with his mantle is the God who this morning can take away your sin. The one who can forgive you. The one who can make you clean. The one who can save your soul. And if you come to him and ask him to wash you in his blood and ask him to be your savior and ask him to deliver you, then praise God this morning, a miracle will take place in this, this building. Maybe you're at home, a miracle will take place in your very home. You know why? Because he is still the God of miracles. And the greatest miracle that can ever, ever, ever be done was not the creating of the world. It wasn't the creating of light. The greatest miracle that ever can be done is when a sinner is saved from their sin. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to him and he is brought into the family of God. God can do that miracle for you today. Man, woman, boy or girl, don't leave in your sin. Don't leave rejecting the Lord. Don't leave without any hope or assurance of heaven. You make sure it's your duty to know that you're going to heaven. And praise God you can know right now. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee and we praise thee for the privilege of meeting around thy open word. We thank thee for the truth of thy word. We thank thee for the gospel. We thank you, O Lord, that whenever we face the river of Jordan, if we do so in Christ with nothing to fear. Oh, Lord, forgive us for those times, Lord, that we have forgotten how great our God is. We pray that this day, this day will be a day of great deliverance in the house of God. Save that dear sinner the day in this pew that they're sitting. Oh, Lord, save the dear sinner at home. Lord, bring them into Christ. May they know Elijah's God personally today. May they know Elisha's God personally today. O oh, deliver, rescue, and save. For we pray to the glory of God. Bless God's people. Lord, we've been challenged today. I've been challenged in studying this week. Lord, we've made vows to thee. We made promises unto God. Give us grace to fulfill them now. And to go through with God. These things we ask in Jesus' name for His eternal glory. Amen.